Okay, Wildcats, we're back with part two of our video. And I know the anticipation is growing and you were just so excited to meet the candidates for 1824. So without further ado, here they are. Actually, there were a lot more candidates than this when the election started. There were three other candidates who decided to drop out or change. And one of those was John Calhoun, who dropped from being a presidential candidate to being a vice presidential candidate. Yet another difference back then, you didn't necessarily run together like we had Biden and Harris and Trump and Pence. You would have all those people running and you may end up with a Trump-Biden administration or a Biden-Trump administration depending on how the voting came out. So we had some drop. The main candidates that were left over were John Quincy Adams. He's the son of the second president, John Adams, who also helped to form and write and encouraged people to support the Constitution of the United States. John Quincy Adams was born into a political family from a young age. His father was very active in colonial and then early American politics. John Quincy went on to become the minister or ambassador to Russia. He was ambassador to the United Kingdom. He worked in France. He spoke many languages. He was highly educated and was just so well trained. He was Secretary of State. He was all these great positions. Um, it wasn't until we had President Bush 41, George Herbert Walker Bush, where there's been a president who has been so well trained in the world of politics. So John Quincy Adams was born to be president. Contrast that with Andrew Jackson, who had no real family. I mean, his father died even before he was born. His mother died of cholera during the Revolutionary War. He lost his two brothers. So here's an only child growing up. Uh, sure, he went on to school and became a lawyer, but that doesn't hold the same sort of prestige that it might today. Um, the only thing that made him worthy of running as he became a household name after winning the Battle of New Orleans. So there couldn't be two more opposite candidates than John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. Now let's throw into the mix the two other candidates, Henry Clay, who is the Speaker of the House. He desperately wants to be president. I mean, this guy can feel it in his bones that he should be president, and he's a little cheesed off that he's not going to have a big chance because he's never been Secretary of State, unlike John Quincy Adams. And Secretary of State's the big stepping stone into the presidency. You had the previous presidents, James Monroe and James Madison, both of them had been secretaries of state before they became president. And then John Quincy Adams was named secretary of state. Henry Clay never got that. And he was really annoyed by Monroe for not naming him secretary of state. So he's really bound and determined that he's going to be president, even though he's only been the speaker of the house. Finally, we have William Crawford. Here's another raised to be president sort of guy. He's from the state of Georgia and his family is very politically connected. He's politically connected. Although he's not been secretary of state, he has been the secretary of the treasury and secretary of war during the war of 1812. So here's another man with great political experience who thinks he should be president also. Well, the election arrives. It's 1824, November, and we have an amazing election held in this country. 
uh, we're looking at a map here that shows the country at this time um, from your training and looking at maps in the past you can see that there is a legend down in the lower right hand corner it says no parties because we didn't have anything but the democrat republicans so you have john quincy adams jackson crawford and clay and the different colors by their names which allow you to look up at the two pie charts above their names and see who got what in the electoral vote and the popular vote. Now, something to consider is popular vote actually means nothing when it comes to electing a president because we're not having a majority from all of the states voting and we just count everything in one big pile. There are actually 50 states holding elections on the same night, and the winner of each state then gets electoral votes. So someone who does win the most popular vote could easily not win the election. And I've made a simple example here for you. Um, in the popular vote, you have the state of California. Now, granted, before we go on, these numbers are sort of made up for illustrative purposes only. They're not totally accurate, but they're reasonable. So in California, you have 30 million votes. In New York, you have 25 million. So between those two states, there are 55 million votes. Among the other 48 states, you have a total of 44 million. So there's an 11 million difference between those two states, California and New York, and all 48. So let's pretend in our example that we have two candidates, Bob and Tom. Now, Bob is amazingly popular in California and New York, and he gets everybody in those two states to vote for him. Nobody casts a vote for Tom. So in the popular vote, Bob has 55 million. Now on the other side, Tom is very popular in the other 48 states and he gets everybody to vote for him. So he gets 44 million votes. Oh, poor Tom, he's 11 million votes behind Bob. So Bob's gonna be president, right? And eh, nope, let's look at the electoral college. California has 65 electoral votes. New York has 30, which means that Bob, winning those two states, got 95 electoral votes. The 48 other states have 443 electoral votes. And all you need is 270 to win. So even though Bob got more popular vote, in fact, won by 11 million votes, he got shellacked in the Electoral College because he only won two states. So that's an extreme example, but that is how someone can win the so-called popular vote and still not win the presidency. How do we determine the Electoral College? Well, that comes out of the Constitution, Article 2, Section 1, Clauses 2 through 4. And that tells us that each state gets two electoral votes for every senator. And each state gets one for every congressional district in the state. So some states have three Electoral College votes, and that's because they get two for their senators, because no matter how big or small a state is, you get two senators. And a state has to have at least one congressional district. So small states like Alaska end up with only one representative and two senators, so they get three. In our current setting, that means there's 100 senators and there's 438 members of the House of Representative giving us 538 electoral votes. So they were smaller back then and so it only took 261 votes 
or there were only 261 total electoral votes in 1824, and you needed 131 to win the presidency. Well, John Quincy Adams got 84, Andrew Jackson, 99, William Crawford, 41, and Henry Clay, 37. Nobody came close to the required majority. And with that, we're going to pause here and move on to part three. I know you'll be back. Part three is going to be really fun. <laughs>